I'm a little bit of a history buff uh, when it comes to construction, and so to try and understand where things might go in the future, uh, I think it's always useful to have a little bit of a look back at, at where things came from. Uh, some of this has been covered already, but uh, modular construction uh, has made significant advances in the last 20 years. Um, we, we've spoken about the code of practice that's recently been developed, been developed, which actually gives us all some better guidance and some, some codification of, of how we might design modular, something that's been, uh, been missing in the past. It brings together some uh, great resource material and some great research, and you all got a copy of the USB when you registered, so I'd encourage you to, uh, to have a look. But in reality, uh, modular's been around for an awful long time. We always think we create new stuff, uh, but pretty much as Nanda pointed out with product productivity, construction hasn't changed much at all. You know, our reinforced concrete was developed in the 1870s. The rolled steel sections we use now were developed in the early 1900s. Um, apparently, we've just started building with a new material called timber, um, which is nice. We've got something new to work with. Um, the first modular houses, though, in Australia arrived in Melbourne in 1854, um, made in London, uh, these portable cast iron houses, also sent, sent by the Bell Company uh, to England in 1849. And funnily enough, uh, some of the things that drove the development of modular in Australia, which was our mining boom in the north and the need to create accommodation, was the same driver we had back then. We had two gold rushes and Someone developed a system to develop modular housing for people to live in. Some of these are still around uh, for anyone who's going to Melbourne um, for the next few days uh, in South Melbourne, where they were erected still, uh, now in the keeping of the National Trust. So if you want to, you might almost be able to read the opening hours there. Uh, you can get in and have a look around and see how early modular worked. And Again, it's the same drivers today uh, existed in the past. Times of constrained labour and a need for housing drove other modular systems last century. So the Nitlock system, developed by uh, Walter, Walter and uh, Marion Marnie Griffin, uh, both disciples of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, was used on a number of projects in Australia. Uh, examples still exist in Castle Crag, a Sydney suburb, uh, an estate developed by the Griffins. And in Surrey Hills, in the Melbourne suburb, uh, and the Jeffreys House, there's a little picture there, still exists, uh, sold recently. A lot of interest in it, because it's a, a, unique ho a unique property. Uh, you can see a few little examples of that modular system there, but it was a modular concrete system stitched together on site. Uh, I guess it's not volumetric modular, but it was the beginning of, of, uh, of that, sort of, uh, that sort of system. Interestingly, Frank Lloyd Wright developed a similar system in the States called the Tectile Block, uh, released almost at the same time. So I don't think anyone knows who, uh, who was first um, with that development. So um, what we're sort of seeing is modular construction has always had a, had a place in markets that were remote or had labour shortage and material shortages. Uh, it is also, uh, from the beginning, being promoted as a means to deliver affordable housing, uh, and that's still a common, a common theme, uh, and it's looked on often as a way to develop a, a cheaper way of de uh, and faster way of, of putting housing up, whether it be social housing, whether it be disaster relief, or I guess very commonly nowadays for student accommodation. Uh, modular, modern modular also provided advantages through improved OHS and the ability to construct indoors in all weather conditions and in cheaper cost centres. Uh, we've just seen that with Nanda's presentation in a factory undercover in, uh, in China, uh, much cheaper than building in Australia. So as we come forward to, I guess, more contemporary times, mass modular construction really gained a foothold in the, with the entry of the major companies such as CIMC and Royal Wolf in the early 2000s. And they customised shipping container technology that allowed them to deliver accommodation modules for mining camps and for social housing. And that system still exists and it still has a, has a place and a use in the market. Um, this is one of the biggest ones. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever been to it, but the Keep One and Project in the Netherlands, um, shown below, used the CIMC modules shipped from Asia to the site. You can see the challenges of transporting there and the weather conditions you go through uh, en route. You might be in the dry in a factory, but you're not in the dry on the back of a ship. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we also heard uh, from Anthony that you know, one of the other advantages of modular is disassembly. And this site has now been sold. Uh, they're going to redevelop it and put something else on it. And the modules have been bought to be 
disassembled and replaced uh, somewhere else. I don't know whether it's a single development, multiple developments or whatever, but it is showing the true uh, recyclable nature of, of modular construction. So numerous companies uh, joined in the industry to, to exploit the adv advantages of modular at this time, uh, mainly for single dwelling and low rise apartments and similar scale projects. Uh, the shipping container model that we saw really only worked for about six to, uh, six to eight storeys, after which uh, lateral loads and vertical loads uh, started to beat it. The flat pack systems, which Nanda mentioned, uh, were also being developed at this time, and I guess we had the infamous um, broad group, 15 Level Arc Hotel, that we also the, saw, saw the video of a hotel being built in two weeks or, or whatever it was. Uh, didn't get much more traction after that. Uh, but many others uh, also sought to develop systems for taller buildings and numerous systems for connections, which is one of the keys, uh, connecting modules. Again, we saw the spec system from Anthony. Uh, uh, and transferring loads were patented. And the IP was very closely guarded by a lot of manufacturers, a lot of money spent on research, and perhaps the only way to get a return was to protect that and keep it, keep it to yourself. Um, the next iteration in volumetric modular uh, was logically steel framed and lightweight, and I've, I've uh, mentioned the unitised building system that Nanda just presented. And that was probably one of the most sophisticated developments uh, at, at that time. Uh, these were able to deliver much larger spans, um, sorry, uh, able to d deliver much larger spans and we're getting up to around 12 to 16 floors. Um, similar systems were, went into development by other people uh, around the world, most locally local to their marketplace, uh, and, but typically they were limited by the small axial load capacity of small steel columns and the ability to transfer lateral loads. Um, via cores or whatever. Um, in more recent years, and this has all happened fairly quickly, uh, the tall limit has been cracked uh, by the volumetric modular market. Um, firstly, uh, we'll put up our hand. We had our 30 level Soho apartment in uh, development in Darwin, uh, which had the title of world's tallest for about five minutes. Um, and more recently, I guess, by Shop Architects Dean in Brooklyn, which made 32 levels, and that's pretty much all modular, whereas ours, um, ours sat on top of a, a six-level podium. Um, a significant effort, but it, uh, I don't think it actually set any speed records. Um, many new systems by this point utilise the technology and labour force um, displaced from um, declining manufacturing industries. And we've certainly seen that happen in Australia. In fact, there's even, uh, I guess, grants and funding for people in construction to employ uh, people and processes that have been displaced from the car industry. You know, Ford, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Holden, they've all gone, uh, but they've left behind a lot of skilled people. And that is one of the real advantages of, uh, of using those people in modular. So we learnt new terminologies, uh, such as DFMA, Design for Manufactured Assembly, and Lean Construction, as the efficiencies of the production line were introduced to, to construction. And this is really, I guess, the future and the benefit and the driver for modular. Um, as Nanda pointed out, and we saw it in another presentation yesterday, construction efficiency has just been static uh, for about 60 years. Um, so inevitably, this leads to a move to uh, mass-produced parts of the industry uh, to move the move, sorry, the mass produ production from expensive places like Australia uh, to efficient Asian countries with market size, but also capital to invest in equipment and te technology. Um, the, you know, you can imagine the cost of setting up a factory, production lines, uh, robotics, uh, all of the controls, and. Um, and you need to go to a market where you can afford to do it and that has the capital to invest. So offshore manufacture uh, led to another change uh, and that was the need to transport long distances by ship and road. And that's something again that the, uh, the, the handbook covers extremely well. It gives, uh, gives guidance all consolidated in one place on how to design for transport, both picking it up with a crane in a factory, from the crane in the factory onto a truck, from the truck onto a ship, from the ship onto another truck, uh, and then finally being lifted onto the site. And they're all totally different load conditions that a, a volumetric module, or even a flat pack, um, undergoes during its, uh, during its history. And they're all different. And uh, 
having uh, worked on the one in Darwin where we, uh, we built them in southern China and drove them on a road that was barely a road to the port, I think it got its, uh, its most significant load test in about the first kilometre um, bouncing around. Um, so flat pack systems, as Nanda presented, are the logical solution to these issues, perhaps with the incorporation of modular wet areas uh, which are smaller and suitable for transport in a container or, or more easily on a truck or a ship. Uh, and these sort of systems are also more able to be used into, into much taller structures. Um, and there's an example in Melbourne, um, uh, the 44 level Hickory de development, the Latrobe Tower. Um, Unfortunately, no images available for that. I think uh, George Egger is keeping them fairly simple, but he is presenting on it if you're going to Melbourne, and hopefully we'll learn a, we learn a little bit more. But it is, it's, a, uh, it's a modular structure with attached facade system that is assembled. Uh, the wet areas are modular pods which are inserted, and then the rest of the fit-out is, is done on site. And that sort of system, uh, you're not constrained by height. Really, it is um, much in the same way we did Soho. It is just modularising conventional construction techniques. It just does it a lot more sophisticatedly. Uh, and we just saw Nanda has presented on the next evolution of his thinking on a, on a similar vein. Um, so volumetric modular, um, where does it go? I think it remains a, a viable solution for smaller footprints uses, such as student accommodation hotels, and, uh, and it's always appropriate for remote communities, disaster accommodation and similar. Um, so the development Improvement of new systems continues, but where does modular go now? Um, I've always had a question in my mind that the secrecy in modular, um, the development of modular systems, has been a factor in limiting the take-up. It hasn't gone as quickly as it could. Um, we don't share from each other's mistakes. Uh, we all have to do the same research. But again, I totally understand if you're investing in that research, uh, you need to get a return on it before you share it with the world. Uh, I guess the issue is, though, how much faster would modular have gained, uh, gained penetration and how much more of it would we see if, if all of this information was shared? And, and again, the handbook uh, is one of the ways that that sort of knowledge is going to be shared. And I guess, again, looking back in history, you look at the way systems developed and, and how that impacted on thing. And I, I note that the Monia system for reinforced concrete was patented in, 1870, in the 1870s originally for plant pots, but it did develop into a construction technique, but didn't actually get any general acceptance to the early 1900s. Uh, and again, I think that is, uh, there was limited access to that technology and knowledge, um, and you probably had to, to pay a licence fee to build to that patent. On that, uh, on that speed of progress, we have about 15 more years before modular gets real penetration, but I don't think so. I think we're living in a much faster world than uh, the 1900s. So what's next? <laughs> Um, we are in a time of explosive growth in intelligent systems. Um, we've already seen attempts to 3D print buildings and components. Um, artificial intelligence and robotics are predicted to progress exponentially over a generation in the same way that computing did in the early 1970s to today. Uh, robotics already are already used on production lines and particularly appropriate for the mass assembly of volumetric construction and also in the assembly, uh, you know, the welding, the fabrication and everything else. Um, an AI for design, which we hear is already making uh, lower level accountants and lawyers redundant, uh, is apparently going to make me redundant as a structural engineer sometime in the, the near future. The thinking is not architects though. For some reason an architect's thinking can't be replicated by a machine. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? So the big question is, for modular, once we have robots who can build significant parts of buildings on site in all weather conditions, without handrails, without stairs, without scaffold, will we still have modular? Or will modular go back to a solution for remote and portable communities and individual houses? So, a few examples of things that are happening already. Uh, there are two bricklaying robots, I think, at least, that, are, that have been published. Sam, the semi-automated mason here uh, from Construction Robotics in the USA, and there was one also developed in Western Australia. Um, they lay a thousand bricks an hour in the experimental stage, which is about, in Australian bricklaying rates, about three days production for a single person in an hour. 
Um, so as those sort of systems develop, um, there are other ways to build beyond conventional and modular. And here's another robot here, which is MIT's digital construction platform, and it printed uh, foam formwork for quite a big dome. I couldn't get dimensions on it, but it looked to me to be about 16 metres diameter. Uh, it printed that whole dome in three days, uh, onto which you could then place, um, place concrete. Um, funnily enough, we're going back to domes. You know, we built them in the 1950s, and virtually every sci-fi movie I saw in the, you know, when I was a kid, everyone lived in a dome. So obviously the way of the future. So is, this the, uh, is the future of modular a fad like uh, the binny shell or the set siphon system uh, that we saw in the 1950s where everyone thought we were building to modern technology? Um, I don't think so. Um, modular has already changed enormously in the last 10 years and it's shown that it is much more able to adapt to new technology, new thinking, uh, new IT, uh, and new and workforce changes than conventional construction systems. And I think even more so, that makes it a way of the future. And that if anything is going to become redundant, it'll be conventional construction, and uh, that'll be replaced by robots. Um, modular might also be done by robots, but it'll be a system that's built in a factory with much tighter control, where you can have the investment on all the systems to build. Thank you.